Thank you everyone so much for joining us. If you could uh, just bear with us a moment or two, we're gonna wait one more minute and see if uh, more people arrive and then we'll get started. Okay, uh, good evening. Uh, welcome everyone to um, this uh, Embrace Dialogue Academia seminar number five. We are absolutely delighted to have you here uh, for Rodemos el Dialogo. It's a great pleasure to organize this series of Embrace Dialogue seminars with Merton College. So on behalf of Red, I wanna welcome you all and I wanna try to set the rules of the game for this evening in which we are gonna have a fantastic seminar. Uh, in Rodemos el Dialogo, we have been working on peace building for the last eight years. Um, and in the last eight years, we have been trying to follow uh, the efforts that different sectors of Colombian society have done to build peace. Uh, we were inspired by the leadership of President Juan Manuel Santos and uh, the FARC when they started negotiations in 2012. Um, after they uh, started negotiations in Havana, we um, started to find different uh, avenues to try to support those efforts. We have been building a team of more than 90 people between Colombia and the United Kingdom. And now we uh, have different teams uh, doing research on different areas of uh, the peace building efforts in Colombia, like uh, transitional justice, like reincorporation of the FARC. And we are also exploring the importance of culture. Um, as part of our efforts, we have an, a, a team that uh, brings together academics doing research on peace building issues. And Gwen is part of that, and she will be chairing this event this evening. Uh, before I hand over to Wen, I just want to mention the rules of the game, as I said, that we have tried to create with Rodemos El Dialogo to make these spaces, spaces of trust, spaces of uh, co-responsibility and of building something meaningful for all of you who come here and to uh, decide to join us. So the first uh, is that we want honesty and we suggest that this is a space in which you can say what you think. Um, the second one is respect. So we strive to respect people's opinions and different views on these matters. The third principle is uh, solidarity. We understand that these efforts are important because we are part of a bigger uh, society uh, in which there are vulnerable sectors who are suffering uh, the impact of war. The fourth principle is generosity. We invite you to give the best of yourselves in the next hour and a half or two hours so that we can get the most of, of each one of us. The fifth principle is co-responsibility. We believe that this is a small but important contribution to Colombia. So we will be uh, live streaming this and sharing it with more people for them to think new ways of supporting peace building in Colombia. And finally, the last principle is self-criticism. We believe that this is a great opportunity for us to reassess our prejudices, to think twice about some of the obstacles that in our minds exist today that make us um, that makes it uh, more difficult for us to contribute to peace building in Colombia and in the world. So we hope that you embrace these principles this evening 
and I hand over now to Gwen uh, for her to uh, start uh, formally this event. Thank you very much, Andre, and thank you all so much for coming to this Embrace Dialogue Academia seminar uh, number five, the second of this term. Uh, welcome on behalf of Merton College, um, as well as Rodemos en Dialogo. I'm Gwen Bernit. I'm a researcher at Merton College here at Oxford. And these seminars are um, an initiative that we've been working on in Rodemos en Dialogo's academia team um, to try to create spaces where we can hear presentations of uh, recent um, academic research on some different aspects of peace and conflict in Colombia, and then um, have a dialogue about what the policy implications are for contemporary peace building challenges in Colombia. So we have a really fantastic um, seminar for you today uh, with Dr. Pete Watson, who's visiting associate fellow at the Department of Spanish, Portuguese and Latin American Studies at the University of Leeds. Um, who did his PhD at the University of Sheffield. And um, he is going to present uh, a preview uh, for us today, which is really exciting, of his forthcoming book, which is called The Only Thing That Unites Us, Football and Nation Building During the Presidency of Juan Manuel Santos, um, forthcoming with Liverpool University Press. Um, and this is a really exciting topic uh, for those of us who are interested in the role of culture and identity in peace building. Um, and I have to say, as a complete football ignorant myself, I'm really uh, cognizant and respectful of the important role that football plays in Colombian culture. And I'm really interested to hear um, what, um, how, how it was used to try to bring Colombians together at a time in which the whole country was engaged in a nationwide effort to, um, to, to, to end the conflict with the FARC guerrilla. And we're going to give the really difficult job um, of trying to tease out some of the policy implications for today to Professor Matthew Brown, Professor in Latin American History at the Department of Hispanic, Portuguese and Latin American Studies at the University of Bristol. Um, so uh, the way that this is going to work is Pete is going to present first of all for about 30 minutes, and then we're gonna turn over to Matthew um, for about 10 minutes, who's going to uh, tease out some of the uh, current uh, policy implications of Pete's research. Um, and I hope they won't mind me revealing uh, that Matthew was in fact uh, one of the examiners in Pete's Viva. So this is a very special kind of pairing of, um, uh, as well as them both being you know, extremely um, distinguished and wonderful people who I'm really, really happy to have um, in this seminar uh, with us today. It's also quite interesting to see, to see that pairing um, happening again in a, in a seminar setting. Um, so, and then we will of course turn over to a Q&A with all of you and we will have hopefully two, maybe three rounds of questions. And so I do encourage you to, during the presentations, um, note down your questions uh, and so save them for uh, the Q&A portion. And we will be asking you to turn on your camera and microphone if you're able to, to ask your question yourself so that it's not just me. Um, reading out the questions. If you prefer to type them in the chat, you can, of course, do that as well. Um, I'll be asking you to raise your hand or um, say, I've got a question, writing it in the chat so that um, I can see that you would like to, to speak. Um, and bear in mind, as Andrea did mention, and as you'll see in the top left hand corner, we are recording this and it is transmitting live on YouTube. Laura has posted the YouTube link in the chat function in case you would like to share it with people. Um, so just bear that in mind. If you prefer not to be recorded, then maybe um, either don't ask a question or ask your question by typing it in the chat box instead uh, of, um, of uh, asking it live. Um, so that is all from me in terms of introductions, other than just to thank both of our speakers for their um, willingness to accept this invitation and to all of you for being here on a Thursday evening to talk about football, nation building and peace building in Colombia. Um, so without further ado, Peter, over to you. OK, um, let's see if I can just share my my screen. Um, hopefully that's going to come up. Not yet. Okay. Is that working? Everyone, can everyone see that? Gwen, is that fine? 
Yep, perfect. Um, so first of all, thank you very much, Gwen, uh, for the invitation. Thank you, obviously, to Rodiemos El Dialogo and to, and to Merton for the opportunity to, to talk this evening. Um, the, the word forthcoming is a little bit, uh, you know, too forthcoming, possibly. Uh, the book's currently at the kind of appraisal stage, so hopefully it will come out. But this is really a discussion of the thesis, certainly, um, and... The thesis was really looking at the sporting nationalism project of Juan Manuel Santos over his eight years in the presidency. Um, that's gone into the wrong place straight away, which is a great start. So um, if we start with what I'm going to talk about, um, this is really just going to look at three of the most important strands of Santos's sporting nationalism project. To start with, though, it's really important just to explain why everyone thinks that football should function in this way in Colombia. Before we kind of go into what he did, it's important to get an understanding of the social currency uh, and the symbol and what football, what values football seems to have been attributed by, by Colombians. Um, the three bits I'm going to talk about are particularly his discourse. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the, uh, the government sponsored projects for sport for development and peace. Uh, and a little bit, because we're looking at policy as well, a little bit about some of the legislation and public policies that were enacted during the Santos uh, regime to support this, this idea of sporting lashes and but directed towards peace. Um, there are plenty of examples of football's use during the Santos regime. Here are just some of the many, many pictures of Santos in the football shirt or surrounded by footballers. Um, I think one of the things you can characterise football of in Colombia is it's a very, it's a multiple, easily used, easily malle very malleable, very adaptable um, tool, which can be directed towards many different potential projects. Santos, as we can see, used it for diverse uh, projects such as diplomacy. There with Evo Morales. Um, there, you know, that's a part of, that's uh, giving the shirt to the Pope as well. The Pope actually has at least four Colombian football shirts at the moment. He's got a very good collection. Um, one of the other ways in which Santos used football was a way to, to kind of establish a greater sense of horizontal communication with the nation. He, was, he wasn't renowned as one of the better presidents in terms of communication. Sometimes find it rather difficult to connect. And so football, you know, was one way in which he could connect with, with the electorate, you know, establish the sense of a horizontal comradeship being part of the national fan group. Um, it was also used for a, by a huge amount of the ministries. Um, down in the right-hand corner, we see Carlos Valderrama. That was part of, I think, the Unidad para las Victimas, the, the, the kind of unit for victims, part of Rocho there. There were also football projects from the Department of Education, the Department of Health, the uh, the foreign office the um the youth administrative department the agency for incorporation amongst many others so football was directed to all kinds of projects it's not just a government project there are lots of ngos that have football based campaigns various businesses uh, in fact drummond mining company being one a sponsor football tournaments for various purposes as do kind of local organizations for their own diverse ends so football is is a, is a you know a real tool for the country so what is it important for? I want to start with a picture that goes back to September 1993. Probably one of my favourite football pictures from Colombia, actually. This is the cover of Semana magazine in September 1993, after Colombia had beaten Argentina 5-0 to qualify for the World Cup in 1994. Gabriel Garcia Marquez described it as one of the three most important events of Colombia in the 20th century. And the headline and the, the cover strap line are really important to show you what kind of impact football has. It says, thanks, guys. In the middle of the darkness of violence, the national Colombian football team kind of grants a ray of light with qualification to the World Cup. So at this time, it's worth remembering that Colombia is, is experiencing one of its most traumatic periods. You know, this is the period of the drug cartel wars, the, the battles with the FARC are going on. There's paramilitary conflict. It's known as one of the, the most dangerous, one of the most notorious countries in the world. So football provides a ray of light. Football is a moment of hope. It's a chance for Colombia to show something to the nation and to the world that is different from its kind of universally supposed imaginary. That's kind of what it's for. What's also really important about this is that football is placed in counterpoint to the, the causes of this darkness. Football is somehow different. It doesn't include the worst aspects of Colombia. So the national team, when they play, are something other than the whole nation. This is 
the best of our nation in counterpoint to all those elements that are causing us problems. And I've kind of these, the quotes that are below are just some of the multiple ways in which football is described. It's described as an escape valve that takes us away from all the trauma and tragedy. It's an alternative reality. It gives us something different. And some of the power of, uh, that people said is quite remarkable. Football gave us what politicians could not. That was the one thing we could believe in. It was the one thing that could bring us together. It's a symbol of national identity that belongs to everyone that somehow isn't linked to trauma, to tragedy, to polarization, to differences, linked to some of the biggest national problems and you know, some of the other symbols that have been corrupted since, you know, since Colombian independence. And I think one of the most telling things that almost everyone I asked from, you know, the, the vice president, the vice minister of, of Col Deportes to football coaches, to normal people, to people running NGOs, is that every, every single person said football is really the only thing that unites us. So football has really attributed a huge amount of value. But, but why is this and what is it really for? One of the most important things that I think happened during the Santos regime was that they carried out a survey called the Power of Football. It was carried about out by the Ministry of the Interior, not by the sports then administered department, to, to find out why Colombia thought football was important and actually what is it important for. So this kind of justifies or attempted to justify a lot of the policies that would be enacted by Santos. To start with, um, again, the question is, why is or how important is football in Colombia? 94% of people said that football was either very important or important, with 55% of people saying it's very important. And the reasons for that importance are as follows. Again, I'll translate some of the most important ones. The top one here says it's important to distance young people from vice and violence. So football immediately is seen as a potential role for combating two of the major issues that have blighted Colombian society. Uh, a little bit further down at 22%, we see it's important to unite the country. And a lot of the other important factors that we see here are things that improve values and social values or create kind of the, the, the conditions for some kind of unity and some kind of uh, socialization spaces. We see things like um, uniting the people around leaders, teaching discipline and overcoming problems, gener generating identity, creating a concept of a team, not just a team as in a football team, but potentially a community team and generating feelings of belonging. So there's lots of reasons that are important for potentially a peace process here. Some of the most important findings uh, that, that this survey, the Power of Football, did are, are summarised here. And again, I suppose the three, the first one is important in itself and it makes the country happier, which is a great starting point. But I think that some of the reasons why football can serve come in the next two points. The fact that it can consolidate and create links and networks, bring together communities at all types of levels, whether it's at a neighbourhood level or a town level or a regional level or even a country level. It creates places for social integration. It creates the opportunity for people to meet, to create friendships, to develop trust, to develop understanding amongst the diverse population. So it's seen as a factor that can transcend a lot of the polarising and um, you know, fissures that the country has. And again, one of the things that Santos, I suppose, is counting on in his, in his policies over the eight years is, are these particular aspects and these particular findings that previously had only been, I suppose, believed. But when you see people attributing or actually saying they believe in this, you, you kind of start to believe them and think that they can actually be acted upon. And one of the main things is obviously the fact that the success of the national team and football in general inspire the country. One of the main things, though, is that it shouldn't just depend on success. I think that's one of the biggest changes from such sporting nationalism projects in the past in South America to the Santos project um, here anyway. Other sporting nationalism projects have been very notorious in South America. Football has been used to mask the atrocities uh, and worst practice of some of the dictatorships we have Two examples of General Medici in 1970, celebrating with Carlos Alberto the winning of the 1970 World Cup, which kind of also bolstered the impression of a dictatorship that was creating success for the nation. And we have the example of Vidal in 1978 with the, the World Cup in Argentina that was there to obscure some of the work of the atrocities that were going on during that particular dictatorship. So football has often had, I suppose, a negative connotation. It's been used to fool the country. It's been used to kind of bolster 
um, you know, unworthy uh, regimes. It's kind of had that that kind of that that uh, image, I suppose. Santos's project is very different. It's there really towards peace. Many of the factors that sporting nationalism projects have had in the past are again present with Santos. We see obviously a discourse strategy. You have to talk about it. Santos's strategy all often revolves around a, a notion of un solo país. We're, we're just one country. He talks a lot about todos los colombianos around the football team, which almost implies that previously there was there were two countries. So that is in itself is interesting. The fact that the, the, the discourse will go on throughout the eight years and not just be located at the time of the World Cup or a Copper America is very interesting. This isn't something that is just there when the when the moment arises. This is something that is a deliberate policy to be used at all times. And it's accompanied by an increasingly proficient use of social media, especially Twitter, that really is there to connect football with national symbols, but also to, I suppose, connect the 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 the, tw the twitter public the, the 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 public that links into football talk online um and try and build psychological and emotional connections which are very necessary when you are looking to establish nation you need to have this sense of belonging of people recognizing each other and this is something that they do particularly well over twitter and we'll talk a little bit about that shortly Santos also is vaguely seen alongside fo the footballing heroes, such as Falcao or James Rodriguez. Um, he describes them as national heroes and ambassadors. And again, this is nothing new. You know, regularly, it's easy to imagine the nation as 11 men on the football pitches, Eric Hobsbawm talks. They're represents the nation. These are the best of our country. So, so far, so relatively commonplace. But I think what makes Santos' project different from many of the other sporting nationalism projects, it, it goes beyond to really target some of the issues that have imperiled or made very difficult the national project to start with. There are legislation and public policies that originally conceived to have merely a, a punitive approach to try and stop the reasons in professional football. And they go beyond that to become um, policies that envisage a much more socially, social, developmental and transformative role for football in the country. They empower football to, to try and target some of the biggest problems that Colombia has, whether this is violence or crime or whether this is improving education or health. Football is empowered to do that and it originates from, you know, very, you know fairly strict legislation. You know, it becomes tasked with promoting the peace process and it brings in the nation's enemies into the national us as fans. That's that's something that that was e most easily achieved probably in football rather than any other method, I'd argue. And not only is it tasked with promoting the peace process when Santos is talking about, you know, the presidential campaign on 2014 or, you know, the, the plebiscite in 2016 is actually a fundamental, very important part of the reintegration and reconciliation processes in the demobilization camps after the FARC demobilized into, into the camps across the nation. As a result, these football campaigns and other sport campaigns as well become a very important facet of the sports ministry. One of the other interesting aspects is that prior to Santos, uh, Col Deportes was merely administrative department. It gets eventually promoted to you know, cabinet level. So football becomes deployed at micro, mess and macro levels, much away from just the discursive project. It's there to actually uh, you know, bring citizens in and solve national problems um, at that kind of level. A little bit about the discourse. Um, again, I said it was a constant policy. Over Santos's uh, eight years, he gave 99 speeches that had just a sport focus. That's a remarkable amount. Um, and that isn't all the times he spoke about sport. There are a lot of times where he speaks about football or other sports or cycling or athletics when he's talking about other issues as well. There are 99 that are just about sport. And of these, 35 have a football in focus. And what's very noticeable is how closely the men's national football team, uh, it doesn't actually happen with the women's football team. I've, I've written a little bit about that elsewhere that people, if people are interested, I'm happy to answer questions about that. But the, the men's national team are very frequently mentioned alongside things like peace and coexistence, the unifying power of sport, and how sport and particularly football can benefit society. Um, and how sport is really important for Colombia, the Nueva Colombia that, that Santos talks about constantly. It is so it is so clear how often a message of peace 
comes in the next line after he's mentioned the football team as an example of the piece or playing for peace or working together for peace. And the same thing happens on Twitter. You know, of around about 12,000 tweets that Santos publishes in, in the, the eight years, 508 are sport related. There's actually more than that, um, but there are 508 that, that are particularly potentially involved with football. Um, and there are 540 more that come from the official presidency uh, account. And again, we see the same kind of things of 514 individual mentions of the men's national football team. We often see uh, messages about peace and sport or coexistence or unity or benefits to society or benefits to Colombian citizens. And this isn't an accident. I had the chance to interview Juan Carlos Torres, who was Santos' Director of Communications. And it's very interesting what he said. Again, I've highlighted some of the most important parts in yellow there. Um, again, due to the instructions of the president, we try to use football to unify the country. It's been an important element in government communication, but probably the most important thing for the, for the purpose of today, I suppose, is we always link sport and football to the end goal of peace. Again, that's the director of communications, um, you know, talking about this, this, this goal, this, this role for what football was for uh, at this time in the, in the speeches. Um, the very best example um, comes from July the 5th, 2014. This was a speech Santos gave after Colombia lost in the quarterfinals of the World Cup to Brazil, uh, Colombia's best ever footballing result up till then. Um, this was actually the very first televised speech he gave following his re-election, a campaign that was obviously fought primarily on the peace process, where he was trying to sell Colombia, you know, this, this chance for peace. And football became a very important way of doing this. Um, football was going on at the same time as the World Cup. Um, a lot of people in Colombia thought that, um, you know, if Colombia did well, then people would much more likely to, to, to vote for Santos. Um, and one of the things he said in this talk, again, wearing the national football shirt, surrounded by national symbols, was, was this message. We can achieve everything, everything, if we work like the Colombian national football team, united for a country. And prior to that, we've got the aim, a just peace, a peace with truth, a peace with reconciliation, a peace with unity. And again, these are repeated messages. This is not a one-off. This is just one example of an enduring and consistent effort to tie football to the end goal of, of peace. Um, the shirt becomes an important symbol. Uh, symbol. Um, this was a shirt which made very clear his intentions. Um, he imbues the national shirt, one of the most important national symbols of the country, with the slogan, I am playing for peace. Uh, again, wearing number 10, you know, the kind of traditional playmaker shirt, you know, Santos as the playmaking architect, the man creating conditions for peace. Uh, it's also worth noting, you can't see it, in, it's blurred in the original photo, but down the right hand side, the Unidos Por Un Pais hashtag, United for a Country. That's actually on the, the Colombian national shirt. It was there from 2014 onwards. I think it's the first time that a hashtag was ever used. But again, it shows how this message of unity, of peace, of I suppose a presidential campaign towards peace uh, is kind of symbolized and connected with, with Twitter as well, so that people using this particular, particular hashtag are connecting themselves across this country through, through football. And this is a message that's promoted by the footballers, by the sponsors, by politicians, by the press, uh, and therefore gets a lot of traction. And a lot of these kind of images, uh, again, I've put this, this picture um, that was a very typical type of aesthetic use of Twitter. Um, we have, it says union, um, 50 million hearts united for one dream. And again, if there's a kind of a, a, you've got an idea of there's two dreams that are actually talking about. Firstly, the football team doing very well, winning in the World Cups, but secondly, the country coming together united for peace. So these are kind of continual messages that appear over and over again in the form of hashtags, in the form of um, images, uh, GIFs, emojis, and so on and so forth. One of the other most important aspects of Santos's narrative compared to previous sporting matches and projects is the fact that he talks, he brings in everyone into the national football team fan group. Previously, as I've said, the football team's success is in counterpoint to the nation's problems. Those responsible for the terror, the murder, the drugs, the violence were seen almost as not being, not being part of that football imagination. The football team was playing against that image. However, Santos actually welcomes in 
the FARC in these particular um, circumstances say, you are also part of Columbia, you are also part of the football team, you are also part of the fan group, you are also represented by them. And that's a very important difference. It's a very important entrance point. These are two examples, when uh, two important quotes, when Santos was giving speeches, when he was giving the flag to the national team before the World Cup in 2014, in the first quote, and the Copa America 2015 in the second quote, where he said, basically, even those with whom we are negotiated to end the armed conflict, they will also be supporting you. The FARC are also part of us wanting you to do well. And in the second quote, we see a different version of that. This was accompanied by an advertising campaign. Um, there's a, a kind of a short, a little still clip there. Uh, it basically was encouraging the guerrilla to demobilize so that everyone could enjoy the World Cup together. And it had pretty much a kind of a, you know, a fairly standard picture of almost every type of Colombian patting a seat next to them. You can see a soldier there patting the, the seat saying, we're saving you a seat. Come and watch the World Cup with us. Come and enjoy this tournament with us. So there was an idea of kind of an open doors, you know, it was a welcoming in. And if people want to see the advert, I'll more than happily uh, pass those on to people as we go along. There's quite a lot of them uh, later on. And FARC also took this opportunity. Here we have Ivan Marquez and some of the other FARC negotiators in Havana who, you know, as they are welcomed in, celebrated their Colombianness. They wore the Colombian national shirt themselves. This was obviously extremely controversial, but they accepted this chance to be part of the national us which they had been really excluded from for really since 1962, you can argue, where that World Cup against Russia, where they played against the Soviet Union, communists were almost not part, not allowed to be part of that, that celebration. So this was a coming in from the cold in many ways. And again, Fox you know, spoke about them supporting the national team. Similar messages to Santos, we will be supporting it all the way. We, want, we see you representing a Colombia that is united. And again, we are playing for peace as well. So this is... So this was a very important part of the discourse policy. Um, now I'm just going to very quickly to move on to how football worked at a much more concrete level. I've spoken a lot about the words, but let's move on to some of the actions. The most important project where we see football working to create conditions for peace comes after the signing of the peace agreement and the demobilization of the FARC to the various um, uh, demobilized areas, the ETCR, uh, across the country. Um, Col Deportes send 63 coaches to these various camps with the aim of leading sport, physical education and recreational activities. These are not just for the FARC though, these are for FARC and local communities. So these are chances to create spaces of socialization, of encounter, of meeting, potentially of dialogue, to bring together you know, groups that previously were, were, you know, were fighting each other rather than um, talking. Um, of these particular projects, football is by far the most important activity. And all of the, the, the coaches who went to these camps create tournaments. Uh, they were fairly regular, there were some I believe that took place on, on most Sundays. Um, again, on a variety of, of pitches uh, that could be you know, made uh, given sometimes very difficult circumstances. But these tournaments started off by pitting teams of former guerrillas with local communities, with members of the security forces, the police and the army, and then eventually morphed into um, actual teams comprising all different members playing for the same team. There was one uh, coach who I interviewed at the uh, Llano Grande camp who told me about how, you know, there was a team with three or four guerrillas, two or three policemen, a couple of the community were all playing in the same team, wearing the same shirt, you know, traveling to other parts of the, the region to play for them. So that was a very important moment. And this is important because it was a real visibilization of what was achievable. It was Colombians engaging in some of their, you know, one of their favorite activities, seeing a very different side of the guerrilla, getting a chance to see a different person behind them, creating the opportunities for dialogue, for talking about a game, for discussing who was better between Junior and Atletico Nacional, whether Cardona should play or Quintero. Uh, but also it was a chance for reconciliation, for re-identification and, you know, on a wider level, showing the, the country particularly what was possible uh, with this particular peace process. And it was very visible just how many reports, uh, whether it was national or international newspapers or TV stations, would show football as being part of the life of these demobilization camps. And again, we have an example of a match uh, at the Canyon India ETCR in Tibu. 
Again, another hugely important uh, moment was the Golpe de Estadio uh, uh, event in 20th of June 2018 in Llano Grande. This was a commemoration of a fictional, oops, uh, which is believed to be fictional um, event, where there was a film made by Sergio Cabrera called Golpe de Estadio, in which uh, the FARC and the, the army, the Colombian army, uh, are forced to come together to watch the Argentina versus Colombia football match on the only TV in the region. It creates a sense of union and community around football. It's kind of a, a light comedy film. But this actually, I suppose, is enacted in real life. Here we have the Colombians, I think, watching the Japan game. And this was, this was uh, an occasion where we have the FARC, we have paramilitaries, we have victims, we have the local community, we have the... Um, the, uh, the, the, the armed forces, the police, all there watching the football match. And there's a very good documentary that I think it's about 25 minutes long that people can watch that shows what happens when people come together around football, what is, is possible. And again, there are various football matches uh, with people wearing the same shirt and coming together around football, playing and watching. So it's a very important uh, moment of bringing together, uh, you know, previously uh, warring communities. Um, again, there's two quick quotes here. Some of the things I thought were quite interesting from two of the coaches um, talking about this re-identification and talking about dialogue and thinking of what we're learning from these particular encounters. Again, we realise that they were people. Maybe they have a different political philosophy, but we are one that we are Colombia, that we are a country. And Genia Rojas talking about the fact that we'd never seen these before. The police talk of the demobilised guys, the community integrating coming and going out. And again, these, these messages were very common um, from the coaches, from the members of the FARC, from the members of the community. There are lots of various videos that give the same messages. Um, the final thing that I'm just going to talk about very quickly is, is the kind of legislation, public policies that emerge from this. Um, the Plan Decenal de Seguridad, Comodidad y Convivencia, the Plan for Security, Comfort and Coexistence, um, this was actually the, a topic of a, a previous uh, event organised by Rodríguez el Diálogo, where various members of Barras and the Col de Portes came together to, to discuss what the impact of this plan was and how there were various pedagogies and methodologies going on to promote peace uh, in football fan groups. And I think that Andre is going to post a link to that. It's in Spanish. If people would like to watch that discussion, it was great. Please do follow that link. The, the legislation emerged originally to prevent violence in football fans, but it, it moved very quickly away from that. From Although it still had a focus on, you know, working with the fans, working with the local communities in urban areas who supported the major football teams to try and prevent violence, but not just kind of giving punishment, but actually for developing methods, for developing workshops, for developing spaces where, where groups could gather and, and work together. Um, its aim originally, like I said, was to reduce football around professional violence, uh, professional football. But what also happened was that half of the document also talked about its potential for a tool for social transformation. There was a kind of a, an important input from um, NGOs who worked in football, like Tiempo de Juego and Colombianitos, to bring in methodologies that, that would you know, use football for something other than just the professional football level. So this document became became something that could work in the whole country and have whole country aims in different kind of ways. There are lots of various important parts of this. I think that you know we might consider for poly for policy implications. Firstly, it built on on um, on UN uh, and S and SDP knowledge. Um, the the UN um, Institute, I can't remember the, the official title, the the, the Centre for Sport, the Development and Peace. Had, had produced various documents that outlined what football was for. And the Colombian government um, acted on this alongside these NGOs to promote certain football for peace methodologies. Football methodologies that were in Colombia already. The Colombia project was something that had been going in Colombia from, I think, 2003. Um, it also included the fans. It wasn't just a top-down uh, policy. It was something that listened to the fans. It listened to people in the streets. It listened to the NGOs and created uh, the plan around all of these different bodies, uh, bringing them in and, and really building on their, their education and what they, what they saw as being um, uh, you know, the potential solutions. Most importantly, this document becomes a really important blueprint for football's use, 
not just against violence in cities, not just in the stadium, but violence more generally and for social transformation. And it, it really does position football as a tool that can be adapted and, and kind of used in various different ways. One of the things that it does lack are maybe some of the very concrete ways in which you can do this but there are other documents that the Colombian sports ministry has developed alongside the the German the GIZ one of the German development organizations to 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 kind of promote these methodologies it helped connect various diverse football for peace projects and other sport for peace projects uh, and also stimulate others so it's, so it's created networks and it's very much strengthened the social and community sports sector of the sports ministry some a ministry that previously had only really looked at football at a kind of elite level it really did start to contemplate football in the in the kind of peripheries or sport in the peripheries to the extent that there have been uh, policies developed to try and promote indigenous sports which is something i, I kind of hope to to work on uh, in the future so just a couple of quick conclusions, hopefully I haven't taken up too much time. I think some of the most important things that we can learn from Santos's project is that football's kind of adaptability is, is really adapted to much more concrete purposes. It's not just there on a narrative level. It's not just stoking up emotional nationalism and patriotism. It's not just trying to hide the problems of the country. You know, it, it does do that. It tries to build psychological connections between Colombians but also it looks to deal with some of the concrete problems that have impeded those connections in the first place. And these projects are much more enduring than previous elements of sporting nationalism. You know, if you just talk about what football can do when the football team wins, then it's kind of forgotten very quickly, either when they lose or whether, or when the kind of that moment of glory is gone. Football is, is employed towards much more enduring projects to much more concrete methodologies that can actually outlast Colombia beating Argentina or Colombia doing well against Brazil or, or whatever it might be. That's kind of, I think, something that is very important to build on. I think also it's very important to talk about football functioning or having to function alongside other projects. It's not, it's not the solution itself. It's part of the potential solution. I think that football creates conditions for other more important actions. It creates a space where para, former paramilitaries and former guerrillas can actually meet and start something. Football won't, imp won't cause that to, you know, it won't solve the situation, but it, it can be part of that solution. It can create spaces where, you know, these dialogues, these discussions, these projects can be, can be launched. So that's all I, I'd like to say this evening. I hope that's been useful and look forward to any questions that may emerge. Amazing. Uh, thank you so much, Pete. I have so many questions already. I think that was a fantastic um, presentation. Um, of how football was used at so many levels, both at a top-down level, um, sort of at the national football team, but also at a community football team, and also the role of social media um, in the peace process, which I think is particularly um, extraordinary. So um, without further ado, let's hand over to Matthew. Um, Matthew, can you uh, tell us what you think the implications are of this research for today, very different uh, context with a different government um, now with the agreement in place. Uh, what do you see the, the, the utility or the relevance of this um, today? Thanks very much, Gwen. I think the main benefit of the of Pete's presentation is to have got you, Gwen and Andre, interested in football and popular culture more generally. Um, so yeah, thanks, Pete. That was really interesting. I mean, I've got some thoughts. Um, they're all mainly suggestions for areas that Pete might give us more detail on, and I'll try and be as short as possible because I know that um, there's many people here who will have lots of questions, and it would be great to give Pete the time to expand on some of the points that are raised by this amazing research. I did want to ask you, Pete, you can come back to it later on, when you said that Garcia Marquez has said that the 5-0 was the one of the three most important events in Colombia's history. I imagine that one of them was the Nueve de Abril in 1948, but I wanted to, I couldn't, wasn't, you're trying to pick another event from the 20th century alongside the 5-0 over Argentina. Maybe come back to that later on. So uh, in terms of the policy thing, which, um, the publication, oh God, what an egotist. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the, 
obviously, since you did the research and the um, Santos regime was replaced by the, the Duque regime, violence in political violence in Colombia hasn't disappeared, although clearly you know, we're a long way from 1993. But obviously, it will be a great day when we're having an event like this and talking only about violence related to football or hooliganism, or even my Brazilian friends would say the violence of Colombian players on the pitch, particularly when directed at Neymar. Um, so what hope for football and peace? I think your conclusions were really um, cautious and smart. Football won't erode inequalities or create convivencia on its own, no matter how important a uh, cultural activity it is. I don't know if you've seen David Goldblatt's new, newest book, The Age of Football. He has a few pages on Colombia, which make similar points to yours, I think, but a bit more optimistic. Um, I've got a quote. It is by such small measures that football is actually working for peace. He's making reference to some of the um, FARC activities that you were saying there. So I guess in terms of policy um, today, in 2021. I wondered if, Pete, you could reflect a little bit more on the Colombian state's decision to bid for hosting rights to the Women's World Cup of 2023, which it was unsuccessful, and to bid for the 2030 World Cup, Men's World Cup, alongside Peru and Ecuador. You, A, do you think that those are... Um, those decisions are informed by the same strategy of using football for peace or football for um, commercial expansion, whatever. Um, and would they, in your, in the event that Colombia was successful in being the host country for the 2030 FIFA Men's World Cup, would that be a force for peace, do you think? Or again, we can ask our Brazilian friends and colleagues um, what they think the effects of hosting the World Cup and the Olympics were in terms of um, social consensus and convivencia. So I think that's that's kind of the 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 headline question really about you know this decision to host for these mega events. Then um, I have a kind of historian's question you'll excuse me i mean Pete, in the the phd viva which i enjoyed very much of course um i think i made this point then i'll make it again because i think it's important which is one of historical continuity you know, you've said a few times that santos the santos regime was kind of uh, unique or doing things were, which were unprecedented but you know colombia has a period like that before which is in the late 1940s so immediately after the bogota so there's the Vuelta Colombia begins that year um, with state support and regional support at many levels and the El Dorado Professional Football League, National Football League and the attraction of major world players like Di Stefano and some of the English players as well. So you know that seems to be quite a good model here but without social media and even the Liberal Republic of the 1920s where municipal stadia are built, velodromes, football grounds. You know, so I wonder, you know, is there, just to give you the opportunity to expand to the same question again, you know, what is unique about this or to what extent is it unique? And then I think the last question is, um, in order to give way to everybody who's taken the time to come, I guess it's more of a conceptual one about policy. Like if you were the Minister for Sport and you were, or you were advising the Minister for Sport who said, I want to use a sport that's going to promote convivencia, respect, all of the amazing Rodemos El Dialogo, um, rules for life, rules of the game, if you like, respect, convivencia, tolerance, and so on, you wouldn't choose football. Right, a binary game which is like win or lose, and if you draw, it's unsatisfying. Like you choose um, a non-competitive sport for a start, like hill walking or mountain climbing, maybe, or yoga or gymnastics or something. So, like, 
why why football you know i mean is it really using the wrong tool to do the job that you're looking looking for um you can talk about cricket there if you want yeah i think i'll leave it there i've got other things but i'm really interested to kind of open things up and see what people say so i just conclude by saying thanks very much pete it was great that's brilliant, Matthew. Thank you so much. Um, and I think we already have some questions coming in. So uh, those who would like to ask questions, please do um, either raise your hand or write uh, me. I have a question in the chat and um, we'll take now a, a round of maybe three uh, questions. Um, I have questions, but I will uh, first make sure that anyone who's got a question for this round would like to ask can do so. Um, you have a number of comments in the chat. We had uh, a couple of questions from um, Charles Jones. Uh, I don't know if Charles, would you like to um, ask your questions uh, in person um, and turn on your microphone and, and camera? Yeah, I could do that. Great. I could do that. Just let me, sorry, I'm, I didn't mean to raise my hand. I get that down again. Uh, what I meant to do was to go to gallery view so I could see everyone. Um, yeah, I found this wonderful presentation, very clear and, and very, um, I was gonna say provocative, I don't mean that, but um, stimulating. Uh, the first straight question I had is, is the appointment of the manager of the national team a political appointment and I think I revised it in the chat and then said to what extent is because <laughs> it must be. Um, the second thing I asked about, um, the key issue in my question was rank blindness. I used to be a, a member of um, a very strange quasi-academic organization called the First Sea Lords Fellowship. Um, and it, it, it was a place where people reported on all sorts of research relating to the Royal Navy. And there's a very good paper by a psychologist who'd looked at the way in which playing in teams affected people, uh, the uh, ship's companies when they were doing other tasks. And one of the key variables was rank blindness. If they mixed ranks in the teams, it made a strong effect. And so that made me wonder about some of the teams of negotiators or former guerrillas. Um, have they tended to be rank blind? Has anyone done any work on this? And the third thing was just a comment, which is my friend Carrie Pemberton has written a lot about sex trafficking and her report on, uh, I think, the London Olympics were 2012. Um, her report on the organized crime surrounding that event is pretty horrific. So I, I would be very pessimistic about hosting. Mm -hmm. I'd steer clear of it, you know. Thank you very much, Charles. Uh, we now have also a comment from Dudley. Um, I don't know if Dudley Ankerson, would you like to make your comment in person or shall I read it out? It's up to you. Okay, I'll, I'll read it out. He says, many thanks for a most interesting presentation. Apart from President Santos's use of football to promote his peace agenda, he was, in my experience, a genuine football fan himself. And Dudley worked uh, closely with President Santos during the peace process, at, so he speaks from experience. Um, Peter Tibber, we are very pleased to have you here with us this evening. Would you like to turn on your camera and um, microphone and ask your question in person? Uh, yeah, sure. Is that working? Yeah, perfect. Um, I thought it was a very interesting uh, presentation. It's a, a new angle on the process, and I was very interested to uh, hear it. Um, also, um, a little sceptical, and I just wondered, you know, how effective you think um, this use of football was, given that uh, there's enormous support in Colombia for the, for the football team. But sadly, support for the process has been much more controversial and mitigated. Thank you so much, Peter. It's uh, lovely to have you with us this evening, former British ambassador to Colombia. So we are honoured by your presence here today. Um, we have another uh, question from Rory Miller in the chat. Rory, would you like to ask your question yourself? I know that Pete said he would be happy to talk about this 
issue of the women's team as well, or should I read it out? Uh, no, it's okay. I can I can ask. Myself. Um, thanks very much for a great presentation. First of all, uh, one of the things that struck me when you were talking was that the discourse was very gendered, uh, and of, of the government was very gendered, and I wonder about the extent to which this should um, feed into future policy. There have also been, as I understand it, some quite serious questions about um, the management of the Colombian women's team. Uh, so the question is, where does gender fit into this? Thank you, Rory. I think we'll return to our panelists now, and then we've got another round afterwards with Christoph, Laura, and Andre. Uh, Pete, um, you are free to respond and maybe connect bits and pieces of uh, Matthew's comments and questions that he made to you with some of the questions asked by the audience in whatever order uh, and combination you see fit. And then Matthew will turn to you to see if you have any additional comments um, on those okay. questions. Uh, right, I'll zoom through as many as I can. So is the appointment of a political, uh, the manager of political appointment? Um, I think it can be. Um, I think, however, there's, there's generally been an attempt from the Football Federation and their decisions to be separate from, from football managerial decisions. One of the main ways in which it wasn't was after Hernan Bolillo Gomez uh, was accused of um, violence towards a woman uh, in 2011, I think it was, in the, quali in the early stage of the qualification. Uh, Santos actually spoke about that. He spoke about the fact that he shouldn't he shouldn't be kept in the job, and actually he was sat very soon afterwards. Um, the, you know, after that, I'm not sure how much per se Santos would have in a manager. I think that there are certain people they would approve of. It was quite interesting the fact that a lot of the success of the Colombian national team in Santos' regime was achieved without a Colombian manager. It was achieved with an Argentinian, Jose Ernesto. Beckerman, who almost kind of, I suppose, becomes slightly different from Colombia, someone that maybe doesn't have national biases. Certainly Maturana, one of the managers in the 1990s, was seen as having a Rosca Paisa. He would he was seen to favour the, the Medellin players. So in some ways, um, having a foreign manager actually maybe helped, you know, maybe made him more neutral, maybe made the, you know, something without any prejudices about the national team. Something actually kind of randomly connecting Matthew's question about the 1940s was almost the same thing that the national football spectacle of the, the El Dorado League in the, 19, the late 1940s and early 50s, it wasn't a Colombian football league. It wasn't. It was a, a league of foreign players with a couple of Colombians fitted in. And actually, I think that kind of neutrality of the foreign players, the likes of Di Stefano, Rossi, Pedernera, Neil Franklin, George Mountford, almost helped towards to make it a less political situation. It was certainly used as a pacifier. And actually, there's a one of the historian in Colombia, Rafael Jaramillo Racine, has found an example of how peace was talked about um, after the, the murder of a liberal politician, um, there was, a, there was a statement to be read out in the stadiums to support peace, to, to go for peace in a football stadium. So that's, I think, one of the interesting times where, that Matthew was referring to. Um, what they also do, though, the managers, the football, sorry, the, the club president will make, you know, the best use of anyone who has a positive impression from sport. Um, certainly um, Santos, uh, I can't remember if he gave Peckham in the freedom of Colombia after he decided to leave. Uh, Duque was left a little bit short by this. He had to try and find another award to give Peckerman as well, which he did. So I think that they are political people, but I'm not sure it's necessarily a political appointment. Um, in terms of the rank blindness, I don't really know um, who comprised the, the teams. I wasn't able to, to visit the ETCRs during my short time in Colombia, unfortunately, for field work. So I don't know if there were, if to what extent players were picked on, you know, on, on the rank. I, I think that it, from what people said, there was, it was generally football ability before everything else, but I, I don't really know uh, enough about that. Um, Santos certainly was a football fan, although I think that um, Juan, Juan, Juan uh, sorry, uh, his communication director said that he, he liked football without being an absolutely huge fan, but knew enough about it. Certainly one thing he did very early on was promote almost legitimize himself as being someone who was a football fan he talked about being a fan of santa fe he's obviously got family links with the 
the the the, the, fam, the foundation of Santa, of Santa Fe as well. He talked about going to see a particularly great um, Santa Fe team, um, and he was very careful to to you know talk about Santa Fe successes here and there just to kind of help that idea that he knew what he was talking about. Um, how effective is it? Actually, we're going, sorry, I'm just going to go into the gender question. One of the things I think he did do, one of the few times he actually spoke about women's football when Santa Fe's women's team won the first Colombian professional football league. Um, you're absolutely right, Rory. The, the, you know, the way that Santa's talked about football is very gendered. Um, I've written an article, which is in English. It's in, it's free to access in Moby Mental magazine. It just came out a couple of weeks ago, which actually analyzes how Santa's talked about women's football. And he very rarely did. Um, the, the women's team, despite having a number of important successes, getting to the second round and losing to the US um, in 2015 World Cup, they did very well in the, um, in the, in the Pan Americans, they won that, they did pretty well in the Copper America as well. Santos never attributes the same nation building capacities to the women's team as he does to the men's team. You know, they are not an example for peace, they are not an example for unity, they're not an example of the benefits of football for society. They are, they are, they were, the one time he, he actually talked about them directly in the speech, he described them as lindas jovencitas, you know, pretty young girls um, who are showing the men how to do things and we're very proud of their bravery or something like that. So he kind of falls back on traditional kind of masculine tropes of, you know, of talking about women in that kind of way. You know, footballers are never talked about in the same way. They're never used with a diminutive. They're never talked about as being good looking. So you're absolutely right, Roy. It's completely gendered. The women are not, they don't serve in the same way for this particular project. Um, where they do appear, though, is when he is talking about the benefits of sport for society. Um, but that only appears when they win something. So that and that happens when uh, Katarina Ibarguen and when uh, Mariana Pajon in particular were triumphant in the Olympic Games in 2012 and 2016 and in various other events, uh, you know, during his presidency. Then you do see, ex you know, examples of what women's sport can be served for. But it's the women's football team certainly isn't at all. Um, right. What have I got left to talk about? How effective is it? Um, you know, discourse, you know, doesn't really work. Um, it, it, certainly, it certainly communicates with uh, passions at the time. It makes everyone feel happy. These are kind of extra words and, you know, but the president is there to extol the virtues of the nation. That's kind of what they do. Um, I think that where you can see actual some concrete successes or incipient successes, are with the actual projects at you know at ground level. I think you can certainly see advances with the the plan this now policies. A lot of those policies you would have to argue are often coming originally from the Baras themselves rather than necessarily from the government. But there have been some times where some of the um, the 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 uh, municipalities and depart and regional departments have included the football projects within their development plans and budgets. So you can see it having an impact there to some extent. I think really the, the peace methodologies, the, the projects that are going on in, in, you know, in various parts of Colombia, whether these are government sponsored or, or, or NGO sponsored are having some impact. How much the, the, the football talk impacted on the peace talk, it's very difficult to to argue that people are so entrenched in their views that you know that Santos is you know there's just as much animosity whenever Santos talked about football um, you know as praise for it you know and, and actually Santos probably criticised more for jumping on the bandwagon of trying to use something that shouldn't be used for politicians so I don't think it is uh, particularly effective as a rhetorical tactic in this in this kind of situation. Um, I think that's all of the ones. Oh, the mega events. Just going back to Matthew's question, the the bid for the Women's World Cup um, from the Duque uh, presidency. It felt very. It's not for peace. I think that it is really a more for a promotion of Colombia again. I think that the mega event tells certain narratives about a country. I think the narrative that they were trying to say is this is a this is a country that is fit for tourism. It's a country that is uh, that can do this. It's a, it's a country that's grown up and can host these events. Very interestingly, though, um, if you compare the narrative of Duque before the the hosting of the or the in the application for the 2023 
World Cup. If you compare that with what Santos was saying when they hosted the under-20 World Cup for, for men in 2011. Santos mentioned peace uh, and development and unity there. Um, the Duque, Duque's speeches don't. It's very different. It's, it's talked about development. It's talked about modern country. There's a different narrative that's going on. Peace isn't part of that. Um, so I think that, again, I, I, I never thought that Colombia should host it. There have certainly been far too many instances of of problems going on with the the way that the women's football is managed it's it's appallingly managed the colombian women's professional league is becoming a joke that's supposed to be lasting six weeks rather than a proper season um there were various accusations of um impro impropriety by colombian coaches that were largely ignored by the federacion colombiana de football uh, for a long time that and actually it, it didn't really get dealt with properly until the men's team uh, United signed a signed a letter in communication, um, you know, demanding better treatment. Um, one of the few times, actually, I think the men footballers, you know, intervene in political issues. I think that's one of the interesting things: how little uh, the Colombian football is engaged with with discussions around the the peace talks in or the peace talks or the peace process in 2014. Everyone was very careful to. Uh, say that they would like to see a peaceful Colombia, but not saying we support the police process. Very, very few Colombian footballers in the present team did that. And I think there are fairly obvious reasons why they don't want to put, you know, their necks on the proverbial block at that particular time. Um, I think that's most of the things. That that's I've been brilliant. Well done, Pete. I think, Matthew, would you like to respond to any of the topics that have been raised in the Q&A? No, I don't think so. I think I'd rather just we went on to the next next round of questions, if that's all right, Gwen. Cool. Then we have um, Christoph, please. Yeah, thanks, Gwen. And thanks, Pete, for this really interesting presentation. Um, I just have a quick question on um, one of the pictures you showed in the, in your presentation when the FARC negotiators in Havana put on the T-shirt of the national team. And um, I was wondering, what were the, um, the public reactions to that? You mentioned that it was fairly controversial. So what, what kind of reactions did it um, provoke? Thanks. Thanks, Christoph. Good to see you here. And if I might just take my chair's privilege to interject an observation also about that photograph, just how tragic it seems to me today to be looking back at that moment in which we saw Ivan Marquez um, putting on a Colombian football shirt and joining forces in a sort of co-production of peace effort between FARC guerrilla on one side and government on the other um, versus where we are today um, with Marquez returning to arms. Um, I think that was, uh, it was sad to see that picture. Um, Laura, uh, I think you, you said you had your hand up, but you've now written to me and said you're not, that, that the question's been covered. Are you sure you don't want to take advantage of your uh, turn in the queue to ask a question? Um, Gwen, thank you. It, it was, I mean, mine was sort of linked to how, how effective it is, because I think I always have a question over the spillover effect. So not even just in supporting football, but if you're playing it, one would argue that if you're playing with others and they're from other sides, so taking, I've been in the ETCRs as well, and they talk very much around these teams that are mixed, right, between police and um, other institutions and the FARC themselves and the community and everyone's there and they're playing together. But I almost wonder how much it becomes a symbolic tool rather than actually something that is concrete and sort of actually makes a difference in terms of reconciliation and I wonder also because there's often splits those maybe that are part of the team it works for but actually the rest around them it has no impact on so I wonder maybe that's my question then as to how 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 far there's a spillover effect or if you can think of ways or suggestions or recommendations of how we could better um, have an impact and, and create more of a spillover. Thanks Laura. Andre. Thanks, Gwen, and thank you, Peter, for a fantastic presentation. Um, I, I sort of want to come back to some things and probably uh, frame some of them as comments and some of them as questions. Um, the first thing is, is, is a bit of a, I want to push you here because it's, it's interesting that you, you, you show this image of Santos as, as someone who used the football to try to promote peace. And you get these amazing quotes of Santos in 2014 and 2015 uh, about football unites us. But at the same time, Santos 
in the, during those years was tweeting about the FARC as the narco terrorist. Um, peace was uh, never peace until everything was agreed. Um, he had a minister of defense that was constantly, constantly saying, these guys, you know, I'm going to fight against you till I kill you unless you sign this peace agreement. I mean, can, can you do this analysis without bringing a bit that contradiction or that ambiguity there in, 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 in Santos' uh, uh, vision? Because that contributed a lot to the polarization that the country is suffering now. So I would like to pick your brains on that. Now, the second one is more thinking about the future. I mean, and because you know this is about policy implications and I think we've mentioned this a bit, but and you said, you know, Duque talks about football, but more in terms of development. We are in a moment in which the country is absolutely polarized. You know, the, the HEP comes up with one of the autos and one sector says that the HEP it's a disgrace that is not fulfilling justice, or then that is trying to go behind the good people. I mean, the whole thing is, could football unite the nation? Could football now, in the political campaign of 2022, be a way of bringing, oh, let's not say 90% of the people, but let's say 60. I mean, with 60 is enough. I mean. 70. And if, if so, give us some ideas here. Third, you, you, you said that Santos did something very different from all previous administrations and he tried to create policy uh, in which football was taken seriously as a sports development policy. And yet, as far as I understand, from the event that we did in the past, the plan de Senal has been a disaster. I mean, it hasn't been implemented. The ministers have left it on, the, on nothing. So is it Santos different from the previous governments in that regard? I mean, really, was, I mean, to what extent you build a policy that is not implemented? I mean, did Santos really push for the implementation of this plan de Senal or is Anduque stop doing it? Or the problems were coming from before, because then if, if we, you know, I think there's something there that I really think would be important because last Saturday we had an incredible breakfast with, um, with, with a guest who was talking about the government's policy of incumplir cumpliendo. So it promises and never ever delivers anything. And the final question, if I may, Gwen, sorry, is more towards Matthew, because I want to see, and it's, you know that Matthew is the PI of this incredible project called MEMPASS, and I work for that project, <laughs> and, and, and it's memories and, and reconciliation from the margins, and I, and I would like to hear from Matthew, what's the potential that Matthew sees on football to try to bring memories, I mean, how, and reconciliation in Colombia from communities, I mean, do you think that they, there is something there that should be exploited further or not? And, and how could we do that from civil society? Because I know that you've been working with civil society for that. Thanks so much. Thanks, Andrea. I hope Pete and Matthew took notes about all of your five questions. <laughs> we also have a question from Herman. Yes, thank you, Wayne, and thank you, Pete. It was a really interesting conversation, uh, presentation. Um, and I've noticed that this is one of the very few events of Rodemos El Dialogo that there are more men than women and more men engaged in this <laughs> in these discussions. Um, so my question for Pete is, uh, you mentioned um, different projects that the government of Colombia was working on during the Santos years on sports. And I'm curious about more of the grassroots, uh, that more of the projects that we're tackling or aiming to the grassroots and trying to engage the youth, for instance. I was working at the foreign ministry at the time the, during the Santos years. And one of the favorite projects of the minister and the deputy ministers were these rugby projects in Colombia. No one had heard about rugby in Colombia. And all of a sudden, 
we were having uh, rugby fields built by the foreign ministry with foreign copper with yeah foreign cooperation money. Uh, so yeah, f football is a huge thing in Colombia, but they had no no one had ever heard of rugby, and all of a sudden we were trying to get kids that were uh, being targeted by armed groups to to join them and giving them rugby among other sports as an option to this. So I was wondering if you could go a bit deeper into these projects that different ministries or different institutions of the government were trying to, to do and um, uh, how far did they get, what, did they work or not, or what are your views on that? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Herman. And it, before I hand back to um, the speakers, I also would like to take advantage of being chair um, and first of all, clarify that our last seminar, there were two women speakers. So all of the Embrace Dialogue Academia seminars are very carefully balanced over the course of the uh, over the course of the series to ensure that we have equal participation. We had Joanne Rappaport and Pilar Riano Alcala as our last speakers. And also th this is the first um, in which we have two British uh, presenters. We usually balance either two Colombians or a Colombian and a non-Colombian. Um, but I think in this case, Peter and Matthew are practically Colombian themselves. So uh, I think I'll be allowed to get away with it. Um, and I would really like to, I think, because we're probably going to finish the rounds of questions here, but I, want, I wanted to ask a, a slightly broader question to Matthew um, about the role of these sorts of initiatives that try to, to use culture for political ends. Um, and I think, you know, Pete's title of the book, The Only Thing That Unites Us, is really is really telling and is really powerful. Um, and of course, Colombia has a history of, of being described as a fragmented nation, being analyzed by historians as a fragmented nation, being described today by everyone from FARC guerrillas to the state, to the left, to the right, to grassroots communities as being somehow fragmented. And there is this kind of, discourse of a need to bring disparate people together and I've often found it quite difficult to explain that to non-Columbianists because people say well of course all countries have regions or all countries have divisions you know that's normal um, but you know of course that plays such an important role in Colombia's history it's, it's you know quite kind of pronounced and I wonder you know, in these kind of appeals to, to something that is somehow at the core of the nation, you know, one might be football, another might be, um, Javi, Javi Ramirez has just put about a question in the chat, which I'll read briefly about the role of cyclists as well, other forms of sport, but also other things. I know that Wade Davis's recent book on Magdalena River tries to use the Magdalena River as a kind of symbol of the nation, which brings together geography, botany, history, um, to, to present an image of a, a national identity, an imagined community that could unite Colombians. And I just would love to hear what you think about that project in and of itself and, and, and whether you think there are some things that are better suited like football or, um, and whether that really could have an impact on, on peacemaking in such a complex moment. So I think I'll hand back and we'll start this time with Matthew if you'd like to pick up on any of the questions that have been asked to you directly and also any of the topics that have been raised um, that have been posed kind of more generally uh, and, and maybe take about five minutes to to, to draw some of your thoughts together based on, on that. And then we'll hand over to Pete to make his final remarks. Thanks, Gwen. That's a pleasure. I was just, anyway. Um, yeah. So I think that Laura's question on, you know, how to concretely make playing football have an effect. And I think this, well, I'll answer that one on its own first. Um, clearly, NGOs coming in and organising a match here and a tournament there are not going to have long-term, um, the kind of long-term transformational change we're talking about. So what you need, it's a, it's a simple standard question, um, better funding for grassroots clubs, leagues, stadia, women's, men's. Um, the same for local cycling coaches who are chronically underfunded. Um, 
so all sports really do that's what's needed the targeted investment in coaches facilities infrastructure beyond the kind of um ngo stuff which is filling in some of the gaps here and there andre's question about um you know how could football actually achieve um concrete steps towards peace i mean let's imagine the impossible let's imagine colombia win the men's fifa world cup in 2022 if it happens in qatar if it happens at all um you know is that going to bring about lasting of course it's not you know it's going to be nice and happy and so on briefly but um Laurent Dubois book on when France won the World Cup in 1998 and all the kind of celebrations of multiculturalism that lasted like six months nine months so I think you know yeah, they might buy that amount of time even were that to happen so you know that's not that shouldn't be the goal the goal should be local funding boring municipal policies um I think um, Andre kindly talked about the Bringing Memories from the Margins project, which is the Newton funded project we've been doing for two and a half years now, working with local memory groups around uh, using a variety of cultural forms, theatre, music, um, cookery and so on, but not sport. And that's simply because when we were designing these projects, we thought, is it more likely to be funded if you include sport? No. Is it less likely to be funded if you include sport? Yes, because the kind of general acceptance of these things is not is not held, I don't think, by the type of people that are deciding on research councils. Correct me, anybody who's in the audience who's on a research council. Um, I've, I've tried to get funding for those kind of projects in the past and unsuccessful so far, but keep your fingers crossed for me because there's one in the pan right now. Um, see, And then the last point would be... Um, would be Gwen's point, which is, um, yes, there's a there's quite a body of work by historians on the use of culture for for political transformation rather than you know, nation building. There's a new book which is about to come out by Catalina Munoz, who's a historian at Los Andes on the 1920s and the cultural politics of the 1920s, and particularly with regard to the first spread of the radio shortwave and medium wave radio across the country and then it's in the 1940s with um the vuelta first and then football then you've got um the use of radio commentary and the kind of creation of a a national community of radio cycling fans which is really fascinating stuff and we're trying to get hold of i've got an undergraduate student at the moment doing their dissertation on this trying to get hold of the archive of senyal colombia of the original um, radio commentaries on some of the, the tours. And that would be amazing material if that, I think that kind of stuff does exist, but I'm not sure how digitized it is. And for those of you interested in cycling, the um, this time next week, we're doing an event in Bogota on um, El Inicio del, what's it called? El Inicio de la Bicicleta in Bogota, in Colombia with Ricardo Montezuma and Richard McCall and Ingrid Bolivar, who is the person you should definitely invite to one of these events, because of course she has her kind of twin life as a historian of sport and um, work on histories and politics of peace. So that's me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much. Amazing, Matthew. Thank you. Pete, um, over to you and uh, try also, if you can, there are a couple of other questions that have come in on the chat that I if you can shoehorn them into the long list of questions you've already got. We've got one from Mila saying, asking if there are any other examples of football or sports in general used as tool for social cohesion. He comes from Western Balkans and there was a football match in 1990, Dynamo Zagreb versus Red Star Belgrade, considered an important event in the process of breaking up Yugoslavia. And thank you very much for this amazing presentation and talk. And then Jean Baptiste is asking question for Peter if this time, according to the World Value Survey, Colombians are extremely proud to be Colombian among the most proud countries. So national pride is extremely high, yet still they're extremely divided. Do you think Santos' strategy for nation building and uniting behind the passion for the football team parallels this national pride? And if so, maybe this sort of national building and passion does not have a positive impact on peace building. Um, over to you, Pete. Um, yep. 
seconded uh, Matthew's recommendation. Ingrid Bolivo is, is amazing, and Richard McColl's a really good guy as well. So there's, there's two people straight away to, to look forward to listening to for that event that Matthew just dis discussed. So uh, quite a few questions to answer. So let's start with the reactions to the shirt of, of Marquez and people wearing the football shirt. I think we could describe the reaction generally as quite zesty, quite lively. Um, I don't think it was hugely positive. There were a lot of people criticizing, obviously, what it was kind of seen as selling the shirt. For a long time, the FARC were, you know, like I've said, they, they were kind of seen as being out with the national football team. They weren't fit to be supporters of the national team, even though there's plenty of evidence to, to show that they were following the games on the radio. One of the ways in which a lot of the, some of their hostages communicated with their, their FARC in prisoners was talking about how the football teams were doing. Um, so it was heavily, heavily criticised by a lot of people. Um, I mean, Santos as well was criticised for, I mean, the, the shirt that I showed, the picture that I showed him saying, me la juego por la paz. Very quickly, there was a meme of that saying, me la juego por las FARC. I think that any time the football shirt in general is used for political messages in Colombia, it can be criticised. I think that the even the white shirt that Colombia wore in the in the 2016 Copa America was seen as being Santos trying to gain more mileage for for peace. You know, Colombia wearing a white shirt, even though it was supposedly an anniversary of the first football shirt that they did wear in a Copa America, which was white with a kind of Colombian flag. It was seen as being political interference. I actually asked um, Santos' director of communications about that, and he said that. He didn't, I mean, he said that Santos didn't interfere in that decision, but he was very happy when he found out that it was white. And he certainly wore the white shirt a great deal for a lot of the events that were going in 2016. Um, in terms of the spillover effect, I think, I think Matthew talked about that really well. I think that also it's important to, to say that football in lots of, uh, unfortunately in lots of occasions when it's been used for social development projects becomes a story. It becomes a moment for the mayor or people in an area to show that they're doing something. You have a photo opportunity of, you know, having a kick around in a, in a, in a neighbourhood and it all looks very good. And I talked to the, the head of the Colombia project about this, which was in the Colombian Youth Project, the Youth uh, Administrative Department. And they were saying one of the biggest problems is that it would it would go there. They would they would it would happen for a little period, but then it would just be a little sideshow. It was just an event, and then it would disappear. So actually, a lot of the most important elements of this types of projects, which supposedly has a distinct football for peace, football for development methodology, and that's the key word. Is supposed to be a method to make it lasting, to create a, a, a spillover effect more generally, for it not just to be a football match, for it to be a series of events that are designed to have uh, a focus and designed to have a discussion or designed to have an event alongside it. If those things aren't happening, if those things aren't being measured, if those things aren't being quantified, qualified, discussed, improved. You know, Matthew talked about being budget for and so on. If, they, if those things aren't happening, and a lot of times it didn't, uh, and we can talk about that with the plan decennal as well, then then they're not going to have the same impact as they could. You know, you need to have an enduring, consistent project with the funding, with the facilities that is being monitored, that is being um, tested, that is being evaluated, improved all the time. Um, I mean, that was happening with the project in, in the ETCRs. You know, I was actually invited to attend an event with all the promotores and monitors coming back to Col Deportes to see, to, for them to talk, to find out what's going on, to work on strategies to improve what they were doing. Um, and actually, the, the Col Deportes minister was part of that. She was there for, for most of the afternoon, actually, which was quite interesting. Um, she spent a lot of it on her phone. Uh, which was less good, but but you know they were there, and there were a lot of discussions to talk about how this could be moved forward. And I think that's that's critical for any policy. If these discussions about improving the methods, evaluating what's going on, if they're taking place, then there's a chance for them to have some kind of spillover event. Um, so going on to Andre's um, battery of questions. Um, I think you're absolutely right. There is a there is a huge contradiction, and I think that the problem is is that. You know, football, you know, was a, was, a, was a space for positivity. It's a space for only nice messages. There is very little negative. If you look at the, the, quant, the, the content of any speech at that time, it is a kind of a conflict-free zone. Is everything is wonderful. Everything is positive. Football is great. Sport is great. Aren't we doing well? Aren't we, you know, we're all going to win and we're all going to be happy. It's almost 
it's almost trying to remove any sense of negativity at all. And, and it is a contradiction, but I think that, you know, it's an, it's an attempt to establish really a sense of positivity and, and that's what it's for. That's what that discourse is entirely there to do. It's, it's there to establish that emotional, you know, feeling of, of happiness and positivity around something they can be proud of to bring in Jean-Baptiste's question. You know, absolutely. The, you know, for, I think Colombians' pride has been dented so much particularly in the 1980s and 1990s, that when that football team did emerge, you know, with Valderrama, with Espria, with Rincon, with, you know, Andres Escobar and so on, and were playing brilliant football for a very short period of time, this was a, a great moment for that national pride to develop. And that was even more important in 2014, when not only did they play very well, but they played in a, you know, in a nice style of football. They won the Fair Play Awards. James Rodriguez scored the game of the tournament. The dancing celebrations put a different kind of imagery on Colombia than had previously been there. And it was a great chance for pride in the nation to be seen on a global stage. For Colombians think everyone is watching, we can make, you know, we can be happy about that. And then you can transfer that, that I suppose, that unit, that, that, that sense at that time towards you know as, as, you know what you might want to do at the time which is what santos tried to do through rhetoric again that's only a bubble though um what else have i talked about um the pot oh yeah could football unite in 2000 in 2022 uh, i think matthew's kind of said that it, it depends how they do um they probably aren't going to do very well um their last couple it was quite funny actually when they lost their last few matches there was almost a criticism of Duque at the same time that, you know, Santos was there, Peckerman was there, and now we've got this new manager, we've got a new president, and, we, and, we, and we're rubbish at football now. We can't even do that anymore. Um, Duque kind of needs football success. If, if, if Colombia suddenly start playing well and suddenly start winning and, and qualified, then you've obviously got the normal, you know, routes for discourse and aren't we doing well and we're supporting the national team and we're investing money we tried to host the the cups and so on I, I i don't think that is going to unite people in a concrete way uh, i think it's again just a kind of a, a momentary bubble but people you know will be happy about that at the time um whether the whether the other i think that again football is is just a moment it's not going to solve everything um, it creates conditions for other things to happen alongside it, potentially. But um, I think that the issues such as COVID, you know, the increased violence in the country will will still override, you know, any rhetoric that's going on. Um, it's just another noise. I mean, the, always the problem that, you know, the, 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 the World Cup always takes place as the presidential elections in Colombia, which always is interesting. It won't do next time, actually, which is interesting because the World Cup is going to be in November. So that will be different. So he won't be able to get quite as much mileage out of it unless they've already qualified. But the, the event won't be going on, so it won't be that useful. Um, the plan destinal failing. Yeah, it did. There were several problems uh, that came from this. The first one was that the interior minister changed straight after it was published and wasn't interested. That was the first problem. The second failure was that they never, Santos, despite this rhetoric, only talked about the plan destinal once. There was a real communication problem between the people who were doing it, the people who were organising this plan and Santa's communication team that that failed so you it got off to a really bad start the budget that had been there then wasn't it kind of disappeared and it, it did become it become one of a number of you know policies that are lovely on paper but you know but don't uh, but really don't go anywhere or don't go anywhere originally I think one of the things that has been successful on a on a minor level is that it seems to be taking off or not taking off but it seems to be progressing more due to the efforts of certain key people the fans groups are amongst those because they have a real interest in it happening and that because the fact that people like raul and like john and like various others at pereira and, and various other organizations are pushing quite hard and as, and because alirio and Ver, alirio Amaya and various other people have have you know have linked them quite well certain things are happening it is now in the the department plans or the municipal plans for certain cities so it's it's small it, but it is happening a little bit and but certain things have changed 
Uh, and I think that that could be built on, but I think it's a slow process. And I think that it isn't really coming from the top down enough. There are certain figures that are. The, uh, Al the Medellin was one of the places where it was, for example, they had a lot of, a lot of support for it. And you saw very, very visible events such as the, or the, or the bands of, the, of, of Deporte uh, Independiente Medellin and Nacional coming together and playing together and so on and so forth, which create a bit of attention. So, it, but it depends, you need a lot more institutional support for something like the Plan Desk now to, to actually have the impact that it could. Um, but it's at least a blueprint. You know, it's something that could be built and it just needs that support and budgeting for that to happen. And then finally with Herman, I mean, the rugby is a brilliant story in, um, in Colombia. The women's rugby team uh, did, got through to the Olympics in 2016, which was remarkable. I think that, and again, Matthew mentioned about why, you know, do, you know which sports can function. I mean, so the, the, you need sports that are popular. You need sports that are widely practiced. You need sports that connect people. You need sports that create interest, um, you know, which is why football will work. But I think that sports that maybe don't have those prior connotations that aren't quite so binary, that don't have, you know, regional loyalties like football do, could be successful. I mean, you know, if rugby is successful, you might see croquet. I mean, there's a sport that's going to discombobulate all the kind of people around the Colombian region saying, what is this sport with a, with a mallet? You know, I thought it was cricket. But actually, it'd be interesting to see sports like that, which, which involve the same kind of principles of people coming together in space to discuss things, to learn different skills, to learn different um, techniques, to have a chance to meet without possibly these, you know, the, the regionalist or, or team loyalties of, of the past or with, which maybe don't have situations where you can criticise each other. These, these sports probably do have a lot of impact. And I think that in a, alongside that rugby campaign, the Foreign Office had a, had a, a, a campaign uh, which I think was called Diplomacia Deportiva, Sporting Diplomacy, where they sent various sporting teams from various peripheral regions to Germany, to the US, I think to Canada, to Britain, if I remember rightly. There were volleyball teams or basketball teams, which were, you know, connecting um, different sports with diplomacy as well. There were also campaigns called the Escuelas Deportivas de la Paz, which were uh, run by Col Deportes in some of the southern and Pacific uh, regions, in Putumayo and Nariño, I think, in Valle del Cauca, and I think Cauca as well, which were going at some of these, you know, very poor areas and trying to create schools for sport alongside peace as part of the methodologies. Superate was another one which was trying to connect sport, schools, citizenship, and so on, um, and also some of the organisation of some of the multi-sport games in the Amazonian Orinoquia um, also have important um, peace messages as well as the Juegos Brazos de Montpox, which is in one of the worst areas of Colombia inflicted by the violence with you know, part of the, the, the charter of those games being a very important messages of tolerance, respect, dialogue, getting on new identities, peace. So, so there are lots of different projects that are going on that originate from the government, I think that, or from the sports ministry, anyway, I think a lot of them are developing. A lot of them are flawed. A lot of them probably need, you know, more budget, more facilities, evaluation of how they're doing. But I think that there are at least seeds of potential development there. So I think that is all of them, if I'm not mistaken. That's amazing, Pete. Well done. Um, fantastic. Thank you so much, both of you, for your answers to all of those fantastic questions and perhaps I'll just close um, the session this evening with a couple of reflections. I think the first one is how extraordinary it is to look back at the um, efforts made by the Santos administration in contrast from what we are currently seeing today and I think Andre's question kind of um, emphasized that and you know the, the the tragedy of the new cycles of violence which are emerging in the wake of the signing of the peace accord um, despite all of the efforts um, of the previous government and so many brave and courageous uh, Colombians uh, of all walks of life and social organizations and state institutions and uh, FARC members who laid down their weapons and communities who tried to take advantage of that window of opportunity to end Colombia's decades of violence and 
sow the seeds for uh, beginnings of reconciliation and how kind of sad it, it seems from from now when that looks you know more difficult than than ever as Colombia seems to be more divided than ever um and you know I think that that this talk really has opened up a, a, a big kind of question is how how to use culture, sport, identity, symbols of nationhood to unite um, as part of a contribution to peace building, which is a really important um, and extraordinary thing and goes so much further than the sort of classic idea of the liberal peace and the, the, the minimum um, agreed in peace agreements and so forth, and the importance of really mobilizing a society around a peace process um, and how to do that, um, and how to use uh, something like football to find the thing that Colombians have in common beyond their differences. And I think that, you know, Pete's argued really, really convincingly as to why football was a really good um, thing to try in that, in that respect. Um, and I, I think that going back to one of your early slides about the survey that you asked, that people were asked about the value of football and the top answer being it's an outlet for young people um, in order to avoid them becoming involved in vice and violence seems to me to be a rather um, sort of poignant metaphor or even a sort of allegory of the country, really. And how could we use football to avoid the whole of Colombian society uh, from becoming tied up in endless cycles of violence. And I think there is much to learn um, from, from this case study of how Santos used football um, and whether football will be something that unites Colombians in the future remains, of course, to be seen. And I think that um, we're right to look to 2022 as, a, as another kind of defining moment in which that might, um, that might, sort of happen or, or, or show us the way as to what direction it's going to take in the next government. Um, but I'm sure that everyone will uh, join me in um, saying, Pete, thank you so much. And we look forward so much to your book. And I think that, you know, whoever's going to be uh, winning the 2022 elections clearly needs to read your book. So it needs to get published before then um, so that they can learn about both the successes and mistakes of what Santos did um, using football to unite Colombians at a time in which it was much needed. Um, so without anything else uh, to add, I would just like to thank you both so much for engaging in this fascinating discussion. And I would like to invite everyone to turn on their cameras and their microphones to give our fantastic speakers a round of applause. And thank you all so much for coming and joining us to Embrace Dialogue this evening. Uh, thank you, everyone. Shame we can't all go to the pub now and have a drink and celebrate <laughs> together. Um, but hopefully in the future yeah, that would be lovely. we'll be doing these uh, in person um, again at some point. But lovely to have you both here um, joining from, from different cities across the UK. Um, and thank you everyone for being here. And see you at the next one. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Peter.